in the dark shadows, in the white cold. Fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the Abracast. We are the brave and the bold. By symbols is man guided and commanded. Made happy, made wretched, he everywhere finds himself encompassed with symbols. Recognized as such, or not recognized, the universe is but one vast symbol of God. Nay, if thou wilt have it, what is man himself but a symbol of God? Is not all that he does symbolical? A revelation to the sense of the mystic God-given force that is in him, a gospel of freedom, which he, the Messiah of nature, preaches as he can by word and act. Not a hut he builds, but it is the visible embodiment of a thought, but bears visible record of invisible things, but is in the transcendental sense, symbolical as well as real. It's Thomas Carlyle, Sartor Restaurus. The Abracast, occult, history, conspiracy, and violence. Hey everybody, it's John here for the Abercast. This is the Abercast. I'm in a I'm in a wound up mood, <laughs> so I'm raring to go. So we haven't done a Freemason episode in quite a long time, and the ones we did do are very extensive, I think. So we're gonna pick up this. Uh, we're gonna do another uh, series here. I believe it's probably gonna be called the Freemasonic Prophecy. I think that's parts one, I think one, three or four episodes, three or four parts. Uh, so this is going to get into our other Freemason episodes. Um, this is not written like a one-on-one kind of material. So I would like to remind everyone, if you're interested in this, in this kind of stuff that we're going to be talking and I'm going to be adding in here as we go along, uh, check out the feature topic link on abercast.com find the whole Freemason column and feel, get at it, brother. Get right in there. Uh, you want to look for the Freemason episodes, specifically the ones that have to do with Cain and Abel. Uh, there's an American Sermon episode, I believe, that you should probably find if, uh, if it's in there. This is also going to be getting into a little bit of Gnosticism. So you could find the Gnosticism column on there if you're interested in that stuff. And maybe we'll see how much, but maybe also the Kabbalah. And there's a bunch of Kabbalah episodes there in the feature topic link as well. So like I said, we got a lot to do. So um, I'm just going to uh, get into it. So if you're playing along at home, this is the time that I want you to summon your vessel of the art. I got a brand new one. I had to bust a brand new one out. I fucking got hammered and, bust, and dropped mine the other night. Anyhow, uh, mix up your formula for your weapon of mass distraction in there. And uh, rate... Join me in raising our glasses to the sky and thank you for all the Patreon and subscribe star supporters out there. We got some new ones. I want to give a shout out to uh, Ryan Sexton. Thank you. Uh, Kale Reem. Thank you. And uh, Geoff Hogate out there all recently uh, joined up on, on Patreon. So thank you guys. Thank you for all the Patreon and subscribe star supporters out there. And uh, if I owe you phone calls, uh, I will be sending messages out for the for phone calls. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's get into this. Here's to you guys. Thank you. The featured book uh, for this episode is called the. It's called, what is it called? It's fucking called The Builders by Joseph Fort Newton, 1914. The Foundations. Okay, so I just want to add, I know there, I'm like, let's get to it, let's go. So this is, like I mentioned, this is not 101 material. Um, this, uh, you're going to hear it as soon as we get into this. Um, the... They're going, we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, duality. We're going to be talking, he doesn't come out and say these specific terms, but we're going to be talking about the sons of light, the sons of water and the sons of fire parable, that story, uh, which all leads right to the Cain and Abel stuff. Um, if you're like, I need help with that. If you sign into the mailing list, you get access to an infographic that kind of maps out, um, the boy, the Mikelzadek, the Mikelzad, uh, the priest King Mikelzadek. And that all relates to that sons of water, sons of fire, Cain and Abel stuff too. So, uh, you know, I don't want to retread all that. I did want to bring up that infographic. If you guys want to get to it, you just sign in to the degree of the Fulgar Correspondentia. Also just called the mailing list. <laughs> and uh, it gives you a link to a uh, kind of like a secret part of the website and you get access to that infographic and tons of other stuff. Um, you get a link to... Uh, the set of tar the current the set of tarot cards I'm designing all of the first drafts are done and they're all posted I'd like to hear what you have to say about them though if, if you've checked in if you checked them out and yeah, you get tons of there's just tons of stuff on there more stuff come in on on the way two arts have altered the face of earth and given shape to the life and the thought of man agriculture and architecture. So agriculture and architecture of the two, it would be hard to know which has been more intimately interwoven with the inner life of humanity. Uh, for man is not only a planter and a builder, but a mystic and a thinker for such a being, especially in primitive times, any work was something more than itself. It was a truth found in becoming useful. It attained some form enshrining at once a thought and a mystery. Our present study has to do with the second of these arts, which has been called the matrix of civilization. So I want to just add in here. Real quick. I told you I was going to be adding some stuff in. Uh, okay. So these two arts that, that he's talking about that have altered the face of the earth are two arts that are associated with who Cain. It's associated with Cain. Um, Cain worked the soil to get the plants for his burnt offering. And God did not like that. God liked instead Abel's burnt offering right this is the this is what kicked all this shit off is this is this fucked up all all offering so cain uh, is associated with agriculture primarily in genesis though after the fall and after cain is banished uh, eat, uh out of eden after he's cursed and made to walk the earth uh like cain he uh he is associated with architecture because he builds the first city biblically on the biblical timeline. He builds the first city, which is named Enoch, not to be considered or confused with the Enoch that gets turned, that gets given a set of divine power armor and gets turned into an angel. Not that Enoch Cain actually has this thing, um, 
where he names everything Enoch. So he has a city that he names Enoch, and then he's got a he has his son, which is named which he names Enoch as well. Both not to be confused with the guy that got turned into an angel with the divine power armor and so on and so forth. So uh Newton here is saying the two arts that have altered the face of the earth is agriculture and architecture. Okay. So I just wanted to point out that these are both traits of Cain. Like I said, this isn't one-on-one stuff. I feel like I'm babbling too much. When we back to it, when we inquire into origins and seek the initial force which carried art forward, we find two fundamental factors, physical necessity and spiritual aspirations. Of course, the first great impulse of all architecture was need, honest response to the demand for shelter. But this demand included a home for the soul, not less than a roof over the head. So here we're talking about this sounds an awful lot like the duality of Gnosticism, the material world versus the spiritual world. Um, even in this response to primary need, there was something spiritual which carried it beyond provisions for the body. The men of Egypt, for instance, wanted an indestructible resting place, so uh, built the pyramids. As Capart says, prehistoric art shows that this utilitarian purpose was almost in every case blended with a religious or at least a magical purpose. The spiritual instinct in seeking to recreate types and to set up more sympathetic relations with the universe led to imitation, to ideas of proportion, and to the passion for beauty, and to the effort after perfection. Man has always been a builder, and nowhere has he shown himself more significantly than in the buildings that he has erected. When he stands before them, whether it be a mud hut, the house of a cliff dweller stuck like a nest of a swallow in the side of a canyon, a pyramid, a Parthenon, or a pantheon, we seem to read into his soul. The builder may have gone perhaps ages before, but here he has left something of himself, his hopes, his fears, his ideas, his dreams. And in the remote recesses of the Andes amidst the riot of nature and where man is now a mere savage, we come upon the remains of vast vanished civilizations where art and science and religion reached unknown heights. However, Humanity has lived and wrought, and we find the crumbled ruins of towers and temples and tombs and monuments of its industry and its aspirations. Also, whatever else may have been cruel, tyrannous, vindictive, his buildings always have reference to religion. And they bespeak a vivid sense of unseen and his awareness of his relation to it. Of a truth, the story of the Tower of Babel is more than a myth. Man has ever been trying to build to heaven, embodying his prayers and his dreams in brick and stone. So I'm just going to add right here. Uh, not to beat you guys over the head with this stuff, but we've also done extensive work on the Tower of Babel. Babel. Uh you can go to the feature topic link and find the column on Tammuz and probably some of the stuff in the Genesis episodes, the Genesis column as well. That's why I like getting into this Freemason stuff because it's like, it's literally the thing that touches everything, you know, it touches everything. <laughs> Even with the goofy conspiracy stuff, it gets into that. There are, two sets of realities we are familiar material and spiritual but they are so interwoven that all practical laws are exponents of moral law such as the thesis 
which Ruskin expounds with so much insight and eloquence of his seven lamps of architecture, in which he argues that the laws of architecture are moral laws. This is stuff right out of Duncan's ritual guide, right? As applicable to the building of character, as to the construction of cathedrals, he finds those laws to be sacrifice, truth, power, beauty, life, memory, and as the crowning grace of all, that prin principle, which is uh, polity owes its stability, life, its happiness, faith, its acceptance, then creation, its continuance. Obedience, he holds that there is no such thing as liberty and never can be. The stars have it not. The earth has it not. And the sea has it not. Man fancies that he has freedom. But if he would use the word loyalty instead of liberty, he would be nearer to the truth since it is by obedience to the laws of life and truth and beauty that he attains what he calls a liberté. Throughout that brilliant essay, Ruskin shows how the violation of moral law uh, spoiled the beauty of architecture, mars its usefulness and makes it unstable. He points out with all the variations of emphasis, illustration, and appeal that beauty is what is imitated from natural forms. Consciously or unconsciously, it is what is not derived but depends for its dignity upon arrangement, received from the human mind, expresses while it reveals the quality of the mind, whether it be noble or ignoble. Thus, all buildings, therefore, shows man either as gathering or governing. Here, this is also um, gathering or governing. I need to make a note of that for something else. Sorry for the little delay there. And the secrets of his success are his knowing what to gather and how to rule. There are two great intellectual lamps of architecture. One consisting in a just and humble venerations of the works of God upon earth and the other in an understanding of the dominion over those works which has been vested in man. What our great prophet of art thus elaborated so eloquently, the early men forfeit by instinct dimly it may be. But not less truly, if architecture was born of need, it soon showed its magic quality. And all truth building touched depths of feeling and open gates of wonder. No doubt the men who first balanced one stone over two others must have looked with astonishment at the work of their hands. And have worshipped the stones they had set up. This element of mystical wonder and awe lasted long through the ages. And is still felt when a work is done in the old way by keeping close to nature, necessity, and faith. From the first ideas of sacredness, of sacrifice, and ritual rightness, of magic, stability, of likeness to the universe, of perfection, of form, and proportion glowed in the heart of the builder and guided his arm. Wren, philosopher, as he was, decided that the delight of man in setting up columns was acquired through worshipping in the groves of the forest and modern research has come to much the same view for Sir Arthur Evans shows that in the first European age columns were gods. Overall Europe, the early morning of architecture was spent in the worship of great stones. If we go to old Egypt, where the art of building seems first to have gathered power and where it remains are best preserved. We may read the ideas of the earliest artists long before the dynastic period, period, a strong people inhabited the lands who developed many arts 
which they handed on to the pyramid builders. Although only semi-naked savages using flint instruments in a style much like the Bushmen, they were the root, so to speak, of a wonderful artistic stock of the Egyptians, Herodotus said. They gather the fruits of the earth with less labor than any other people, while... Uh, with agriculture and settled life came trades and stored up energy, which might um, essay to improve on caves and pits and other rude dwellings by the Nile. Perhaps man first aimed to overpass the routine of the barest need and obey his soul. Here he wrought out beautiful vases of fine marble and invented square building. Not square buildings. The square building. At any rate, the earliest known structure actually discovered a prehistoric tomb found in the sands of Hira Canopolis. It is already right-angled. As Lethenby reminds us, modern people take squareness very much for granted as being a self-evident form. But the discovery of the square was a great step in geometry. It opened up a new era in the story of the builders. Early inventions must have seemed like revelations, as indeed they were. And it is not strange that skilled craftsmen were looked upon as magicians. If man knows as much as he does, the discovery of the square was a great event to the primitive mystics of the Nile. Very early, it became an emblem of truth, justice, and righteousness. I'm sorry, I can't pass up the urge to do it. <laughs> Very early, it became an emblem of truth, justice, and the American way. All right, Jimmy, let's go. Back to it. I'm sorry for that. I just couldn't help, fucking help myself. And so it remains to this day through uncountable ages have passed. Simple, familiar, eloquent. It brings from afar a sense of the wonder of the dawn. And it still teaches a lesson which we find it hard to learn. And also the cube, the compass, and the keystone. Such a great advance for those whom architecture was indeed building touched with emotion and showing that its laws are the laws of the eternal. Maspero tells us that the temples of Egypt, even from earliest the earliest times, were built in the image of the earth as builders had imagined it. From them, the earth was a sort of flat slab, more long than wide, and the sky was a ceiling or a vault supported by four great pillars. The pavement represented the earth. The four angles stood for the pillars and the ceiling, more often flat, although sometimes curved, corresponded with the sky. From the pavement grew vegetation and water uh, Water plants emerged from the water while the ceiling painted dark blue was strewn with stars of five points. Sometimes the sun and the moon were seen floating on the heavenly ocean, escorted by the constellations in the months and the days, and uh, was a far withdrawn holy place, small and obscure approached through a succession of the courts and columned halls and so arranged on a central axis as to point to the sunrise. Before the outer gates were obelisks and avenues of statues, such were the shrines of the old solar religion, so oriented that on one day in the year, the beams of the rising sun or of some bright star that hailed his coming would stream down the nave and illuminate this altar. Clearly, one I ideal of the early builders was that of sacrifice as seen in their true use of the finest materials. And another was accuracy of worksman, workmanship. 
Indeed, not a little of the earliest work displayed an astonishing technical ability. And such work must point to some underlying idea which the worker sought to realize. Above all things, they sought permanence. In later inscriptions relating to the, uh, relating to buildings, phrases like these frequently occur. It is such as the heavens in all its quarters. It's as firm as the heavens. Evidently, the basic idea was that as the heavens were stable, not to be moved, so a building put into proper relation with the universe would acquire magical stability. It is recorded that when Akhenaten founded his new city, four boundary stones were accurately placed so it might be exactly square and thus endure forever. Eternity was the ideal aimed at everything else being sacrificed for that aspiration. How well they realize their dreams is shown to us in the pyramids of all the monuments of mankind, the oldest, the most technically perfect, the largest and the most mysterious ages come and go. Empires rise and fall. Philosophies flourish and fail and man seeks out many inventions, but they stand silent under the bright Egyptian night as fascinating as they are baffling. An obelisk is simply a pyramid, albeit the base has become a shaft, holding aloft the oldest emblem of the solar faith, a triangle mounted on a square. Where and why this figure became holy, no one knows, save as we may conjecture that it was one of those sacred stones which gained its sanctity at times far back of all recollection and tradition, like the Kaaba at Mecca at Mecca, whether it be an imitation of the triangle of zodiacal light seen at certain times in the Eastern sky at sunrise and sunset, or a feat of masonry used as a symbol of heaven as the square was an emblem of earth. No one may affirm in the pyramid text, the sun God was created. All other gods is shown sitting on the apex of the sky in the form of a phoenix, that supreme God whom two architects, Suti and Hur, wrote so, num so noble a hymn of praise. White with the worship of ages, ineffable beauty and Pathetic is the old light religion of humanity, a sublime nature mysticism in which light and love and life, the darkest evil and death for the early man, light was the mother of beauty, the unveiler of color, the elusive and radiant mystery of the world. And his speech about it was reverent and grateful. In the gates of the morning, he stood with uplifted hands, and the sun sinking in the desert at eventide made him wistful in prayer. Half fear and half hope, lest the beauty return no more. What if the sun never rose again? His religion, when he emerged from the night of animalism, was a worship of the light. His temple hung with stars, his altar a glowing flame, his ritual woven him of night and day, and no poet of our day, not even Shelley, has written a lovely or lyric in praise of the light and of those hymns of Akhenaten in the moving morning of the world. Memories of this religion of dawn linger with us today in the faith that follows the day star from on high, the sun of righteousness. No one is the light of the world and life in the lamp of poor souls in the, de in the night of death. Here, there are the real foundations of masonry, both material and moral in the deep need and the aspiration of man and his creative impulse and his instinctive faith, his quest of the ideal 
and his love of light underneath all his buildings lay the feeling, the prophetic of his last and highest thought. That the earthly house of his life should be in right relation with the heavenly prototype. The world temple imitating on earth the house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. If he erected the square temple, it was an image of the earth. If he built a pyramid, it was a picture of beauty shown him in the sky as later his cathedral was modeled after the mountain. And it's dim and lost, lofty art. A memory of forest vista, its altar, a fireside of the soul, its spire, a prayer in stone. And as he wrought his faith and dream into reality, it was but a nat it was but natural that the tools of the builders should become emblems of the thoughts of the thinker. Not only as tools, but as we shall see, the very stones with which he worked became sacred symbols, the temple itself a vision of the house of doctrine, the home of souls, which, though unseen, he is building in the midst of the years. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content and access to the private Abracast workgroup by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. All right, that leads us to the next section, which is called Working Tools. Never were truer words than those of Goethe in the last lines of Faust, and they echo one of the oldest instincts of humanity. For all things are transitory, but as symbols are sent. From the beginning, man has divined that all the things were open to his senses are more than mere facts, having other and hidden meanings. The whole world was close to him as an infinite parable, a mystical and prophetic scroll, the lexicon of which he set himself to find, and both he and his world were so made to convey a sense of doubleness. His high truth hinted in humble nearby things, and no smallest thing but had its skyey aspect, which by his winged and quick-sighted fancy he sought to surprise and grasp. Let us acknowledge in man was born a poet, his mind a chamber of imagery, his world a gallery of art, and... Despite his utmost effort, he can nowise strip his thought of the flowers and fruits that cling to it withered, though they often are. As a fact, he has even been a citizen of two worlds, using the scenery of the visible to make vivid the realities of the world unseen. What wonder, then? That trees grew in his fancy and flowers bloomed in his faith and the victory of spring over winter give him hope of the life after death. When the march of the sun and the great stars invited him to thoughts and wonder through eternity, symbols was his native tongue, his first form of speech, as indeed it is his last, and whereby he was able to say what else he could. 
not have uttered such is the fact in even the language in which we state it is a dictionary of faded metaphors. The fossil poetry ages too. Hmm. This is interesting. It makes me think of emojis. I read recently that emojis could be because it's like it's it has to do with emotion, right? That's why they're all like smiley faces and fucking crying faces and shit. Um, uh, emo- the emojis on your fucking cell phone are like a universal language. So like, instead of having to speak Chinese, we could just speak in fucking smiley faces and fucking hearts and eggplants and shit. It's interesting. That, uh, picturesque and, oh boy, variegated maze of the early symbolism of the race we cannot study in detail. Tempting as it is, indeed, so luxuriant was the old picture language that we may easily miss our way and get lost in the labyrinth. Unless we keep to the right path, first of all. Uh, throughout this study of prophecy, let us keep ever in mind the very simple and obvious fact, albeit not less wonderful because obvious. Socrates made the discovery, perhaps the greatest ever made, that human nature is universal. By his searching questions, he found out that when men think round a problem and think deeply, they disclose a common nature and a common system of truth. So they, uh, there dawned upon him from this fact, the truth of kinship of mankind, the unity of the mind, his insight is confirmed many times over, whether we study the earliest gropings of the human mind or set the teachings of the sages side by side. Always we find after comparison, the final conclusion of the wisest minds as to the meaning of life and the world are harmonious. If not identical here is the clue to the striking resemblance between faiths and philosophies of widely separated people. And it makes them intelligible while adding to their picturesqueness and philosophical interest. By the same token, we begin to understand why the same signs, symbols, and emblems are used by all people to express their earliest aspirations and thought. We need not infer that one people learn from the other or that there existed a mystic universal order which had them in keeping They simply betray the unity of the human mind and show how and why the same stage of culture races are removed from each other, came to the same conclusion and used much of the same symbol to body forth their thought. Illustrations are innumerable of which a few may be named as examples of this unity, both of idea and emblem, but also confirming the insight of the great Greek That however shallow minds may differ in the end, all seekers of truth follow a common path, comrades in one great quest. So we talked about this kind of thing in a few different places. Um, It takes me back right to Uncle Joe, right? (laughs) Not Stalin. Uncle. (laughs) That's what FDR used to call Stalin. He used to call him Uncle Joe. Not Uncle Joe Stalin. I'm talking about Uncle uh, Joseph Campbell. An example in point, as ancient as it is eloquent, is the idea of the Trinity and its emblem, the triangle. Uh, What the human thought of God is depends on what the power of the mind or aspect of life man uses as a lens through which to look at the mystery of things. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up is this is something that I'm always talking about on this show, right? And that's magic as psychology. So we're starting to dip our toe into that idea. Even conceived as 
the will of the world. God is one, and we have the monotheism of Moses. Seen through the instinct and the kaleidoscope of senses, God is multiple, and the result of polytheism and its gods without number for the reason God is a dualism made up of matter and mind. As in the faith of Zoroaster and many other cults. But when the social life of man becomes the prism of faith, God is a trinity, a father, a mother, and a child, almost as old as human thought. I mean, we see this over and over. This is in the tarot cards, in our tarot card episodes, right? The father, the mother, the child, the <laughs> the male, the female, the neutral, and the transition, remember? Almost as old as human thought, we find the idea of the Trinity and its triangle emblems everywhere. Shiva, Vishnu, the Brahma in India, corresponding with uh, Osiris, Isis, and Horus in Egypt. No doubt the idea underlay the old pyramid emblem at each corner of which stood one of these gods. No missionary carried this profound truth over the earth. It grew out of a natural, universal human experience, and it is explained by the fact of the unity of the human mind and its vision of God through the family. So this is interesting as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not going to rail about it right now. I just want to make a note of it. Remember to rail about this later, the destruction of the family. And add the spiritual implications of it. Other emblems take us back to antiquity, so remote that we seem to be walking in the shadow of prehistoric time. Of these, the mysterious swastika is perhaps the oldest as it is certainly the most widely distributed over the earth. So remember, this is pre WW2. This is in 1914. This is at the end of WW1. It uh, is perhaps uh, as much as a talisman as a symbol. It has been found on Chaldean bricks among the, ru the ruins of the city of Troy in Egypt on vases of uh, ancient Cyprus. The Hittite remains and the, pot the pottery of Etruscans in the cave temples of India on Roman altars and runic monuments in Britain and Tibet, China, Korea, in Mexico, Peru, and among the prehistoric burial grounds of North America. There have been many interpretations of it. Perhaps the meaning is most usually assigned to that of the Sanskrit word having its roots in the intimation of the beneficence of life to he and well as such as it is a sign indicating the maze of life may bewilder, but a path of light runs through it. It is well is the name of the path. It is the key to life eternal. It is the strange labyrinth for those whom God leadeth. Hmm. They don't mention the black sun. They don't mention the Saturn thing here. Others hold that it may be an emblem of a pole star whose stability in the sky, the procession of Ursa Major around it. So impressed with the ancient world, men saw the sun journeying across heaven and heavens every day in a slightly different track and then standing still, as it were, at the solstice and then returning on its way back. And they saw the moon changing, not only its orbit, but its size and its shape and time of appearing. Only the pole star remained fixed and stable, just like the buildings, remember, you finding its place on Earth. Skipping ahead a little bit, I, I won't... I feel like I'm running out of time. Akin to the swastika, if not an evolution from it, was the cross. Made forever holy by the highest heroism of love when a man climbed up of the primeval night with his face to heaven upturned, he had a cross in his hand, and when he got it, 
why he held it and what he meant by it, no one can conjecture, much less affirm. Itself a paradox, its arms pointing to the four quarters of the earth. And is found in almost every part of the world, carved on coins, altars, and tombs, and furnishing and design for temples and architectures in Mexico and Peru and in the pagodas of India, not less than the churches of a Jesus Christ, ages before our era. Even from the remote time of the cliff, cliff dwellers, he's really got a hang up on these cliff dwellers. The cross seems to have been a symbol of life through for what reason no one knows more often it was an emblem of eternal life especially when enclosed within a circle which ends not nor begins as type of eternity uh, skip ahead a little bit more square triangle cross circle oldest symbols of humanity all of them eloquent each of them pointing beyond itself a symbol always do while giving form to the invisible truth which they evoke to seek to embody they are beautiful and if we have eyes to see serving not merely as chance figures of fancy but as forms of reality it has revealed itself into the mind of men sometimes we find them united a square within a circle and within that the triangle in the center across earliest of emblems they show us hints of four gleams of the highest faith and philosophy betraying not only the unity of the human mind but its kinship with the eternal the fact which lies at the root of every religion and is the basis of each upon this faith man builded finding a rock beneath refusing to think of death in the gigantic coffin lid of the dull mindless universe descending upon him at last we're going to jump ahead a little bit here. Dun, 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 dun. A master mason and teaching apprentices make use of the compass in the square. Ye who are engaged in the pursuit of wisdom must also make use of the compass and the square. There are even evidences in the earliest historic records of China to the existence of a system of faith expressed in algorithmic forms and illustrated by the symbols of building. These secrets of faith seem to have been orally transmitted and uh, the leaders alone pretending to have full knowledge of them. Oddly enough, it seems to have gathered about a symbolic temple put up in the desert where the various officers of the faith were distinguished by symbolic jewels and uh, that is its rights. They wore leather aprons from such records. We have it is not possible to say whether the builders themselves used their tools as emblems or whether it was the thinkers who first used them to teach moral truths in the case they were understood in any case they were understood and the point here is that thus early the tools of the builders were teachers of wise and good and beautiful truth indeed we needed not to go outside in the Bible to find both the materials and the working tools of the Mason so employed for every house is builded by some man and the builder of all things is God whose house we are behold. I lay in Zion for a foundation, a tired stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The stone, which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Ye also, as living stones, are built up to spiritual houses. This is Mason stuff. Like, when he established the heavens, I was there. And when he set the compass upon the face of the deep, and he marked out the foundations of the earth, when then was I by him as a master workman. And the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line and the plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. And then the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore and shall offer the holy oblation four square for the possession of the city and the city lieth four square and the length is as large as its breadth and that overcometh 
I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and I will write upon it my new name. For we know that when our earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we will have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here just to wrap this thing up. Much has been written of buildings, their origin, date, and architecture out of the builders, hardly a word. So quickly is the worker forgotten, save as he lives in his work. Although we have no records other than these emblems, it is an obvious inference that there were orders of building builders, even in those early ages. to whom these symbols were sacred. And this interference is the more plausible when we remember the importance of the builder, both to religion and to the state. This is a kind of a line that we've been looking at since the Tower of Babel and the all the Solomon stuff, right? The temp of the temple the Cain and Abel, the Melchizedek stuff. What through the builders have fallen to dust, in which all things mortal decline? They still hold out their symbols for us to read, speaking their thoughts in a language easy to understand across the piled up debris of the ages. They whisper the old familiar truths, and it will be a part of the study to trace those symbols through the centuries showing that they have always had the same high meanings. They bear witness not only to the unity of the human mind, but to the existence of a common system of truth, veiled in allegory and taught in symbols. As such, they are prophecies of masonry as we know it whose genius it is to take what is old, simple, and universal and use it to bring men together and to make them friends. Shore calls to shore. That line is unbroken. Oh, um, this month's order of the fellow craft episode, I did a I did a high ritual ceremony from the lesser key of Solomon to summon the demon breath. And I recorded the whole fucking thing. <laughs> it's up on Patreon and subscribe star for the fellow craft here. It was a good fun episode and it's going to lead to something pretty good. I think. Um, so without further ado, we'll just wrap this fucking thing up. Um, Oh, also if you're interested in those infographics and stuff, I just want to remind you to hit up the, the mailing list. It's, there's a link in the show notes There's also, if you go to the abercast.com, you can find a link to it. The degree that you're shooting for would be the Fulgar correspondentia. It helps explain a lot of this stuff that we, I just couldn't take side quests to to re-explain also you might want to hit up the feature topic link if you wanted to explore some of the things that i kind of bumped against but didn't get into because i mean we've already done it <laughs> you go listen to the shows and uh i'm john and i just want to thank everybody for listening to the show uh, thank you guys for listening to the show. Thank you for your positive reviews and thank you for your Patreon and subscribe star support. I'll let Hilla tell you the rest. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five star rate and review.